you. I'm Dr. Terry Young. I'm the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences here at University of Wisconsin. And it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you tonight to our fourth Saving Sight session. I, um, we've started this as a um, sort of a, like a mini medical school uh, community event to share with you uh, the great work that's happening in our department. Um, we have a wonderful uh, speaker tonight, and I'm going to introduce him. Uh, his name is Dr. David Gamm. And I have his biosketch in front of me, but the most important thing on this biosketch is that he's a fellow Michiganian. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, basketball, football. <laughs> I'm from Michigan as well. I'm from Detroit. <laughs> but I, I wanted to go through his uh, background, and, um, and then um, we're going to hear his talk. Uh, Dr. Gam received his Bachelor's of Science at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in Cellular and Molecular Biology. He went on to receive a PhD in the neurosciences at the same institution, as well as performing uh, his medical school training at University of Michigan. Uh, he came here, uh, University of Wisconsin, to perform his ophthalmology residency and um, also completed a pediatric ophthalmology fellowship here. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist as well, and it's been my true delight and pleasure to work with David in the clinic and see him in action. David uh, remained on here as faculty and uh, uh, ascended to the level of associate professor in uh, 2012. At that time, he was also named the Emmett A. Humble Distinguished Director of the McPherson Eye Research Institute here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and still um, uh, holds that role. Dr. Gam's research focus is driven by the lack of effective therapies for retinitis pigmentosa and age-related macular degeneration. These are retinal degenerative disorders that afflict millions of people worldwide. He's devoted the majority of his time and effort to retinal stem cell research for the primary purposes of, number one, investigating cellular and molecular events that occur during retinal uh, development in humans, and number two, generating specific retinal cell types to model and treat retinal degenerative disorders. In my opinion, as in the opinion of others, he is a model physician scientist. He's among the premier scientists that working on stem cell technology in the world, and his research is translational. His clinical interest in retinal degenerative diseases, which afflict millions of people um, that lack any effective therapies, is his motivation. And it is my uh, true pleasure to introduce David uh, as our Save and Sight session talk, uh, talker or speaker tonight. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. Um, I really appreciate the great turnout. And uh, my purpose here is to kind of give you a, a general overview and a flavor of what we're doing at the University of Wisconsin in the area of stem cell research, um, and also kind of balance what we're doing and, and the hope that we think that uh, this whole field has for individuals who have really no, nowhere else to turn, um, but also balance that with the inevitable hype that comes along with that and a lot of the rogue stem cell efforts that are popping up initially overseas, and now we see it in the U.S. So I'm going to kind of balance those two for you today and hopefully give you a kind of a realistic outlook of, of where we are and, and where we're headed. And if anybody, and the only downside is I have 20 minutes. I can hardly say hello in 20 minutes. So <laughs> hopefully it, it goes okay. We're going to bring the lights down? Or? Sure. Okay, so my lab, um, uh, the purpose of it is really to employ humans. This has been the same since I started here. I was driven by the possibility of using human pluripotent stem cell technology to uh, develop therapies for degenerative diseases of essentially the outer retina. Now, there's a lot of uh, vocabulary words in this, and I'm going to go through in the time that I have kind of one by one, starting with what is a degenerative disease, what's the retina, what parts of the retina am I interested in, uh, what is a human pluripotent stem cell, and then ultimately what are the therapies that we're trying to develop, and what, are they, what do we hope to apply them to. Because you know, there's no such thing as a magic bullet. Stem cells aren't going to cure everything that ails you. There are certain things that it has uh, greater potential to affect early on in its development. And then down the line, we can expand upon that. Okay. 
So to start off with, what's, what's, what do I mean by degenerative diseases of tissues? So this represents a healthy cell. It's a nice blue cell. It has nothing to do with the fact that I went to Michigan. <laughs> and ultimately then, this does, this is, <laughs> I honestly didn't mean this, but it's very apropos. So and it, disease turns green. All right, so it gets a little ill, okay? And this happens all the time. It could happen due to infection. It could happen due to a genetic disease, so on and so forth, an injury. Now, hopefully, we can apply a therapeutic that's available today, and that will turn the tides and bring it back and make it healthy again, okay? This happens most of the time. But on occasion, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. The disease progresses, and that cell and that tissue degenerates, okay? At that point, there's really no way to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and make it uh, a healthy cell again, nor is it really able to put it back and even make it an unhealthy cell. It's gone, okay? So you're really limited in terms of your options. Now, there are some cells in your body that naturally undergo a lifespan in which after which time it degenerates, okay? So the blood cells in your body have a limited lifespan, and the skin cells on the surface will slough off, the lining of your gut, those, those sorts of tissues. And in those cases, there's actually an endogenous stem cell. There's a cell within those tissues whose job it is throughout your life, if it's doing its, its correct job, to produce more of those cell types as the older ones pass along. So... That's great, but not all of our tissues have this capability, this regenerative capability. And the, one of the premier tissues that doesn't do this is the central nervous system tissues, so brain and spinal cord. And that's why a lot of these de degenerative diseases are so devastating, there's not really much we can do about it. But part of that central nervous system is actually the retina. So the retina is a part of the brain. It's a highly specialized part of the brain, but it's connected via the optic nerve, and it's made up of, ne of neurons like the brain is. So think of it like the brain. Okay, So that's what I mean by degenerative diseases. Now let's talk about retina. So what is the retina? If we cut the eye in half and we look, on it, look at it by, on its side, as a schematic, it looks like this. So the retina itself lines the back of the eye like, a, uh, like wallpaper in the back of the eye there. It's shown here in red. If we take a small piece of this, blow it up, look at it on edge under a microscope, we see that it's actually not just some amorphous transparent tissue, but actually a very elegant layer cake. And deepest within this layer cake of cells are a group of cells called photoreceptors. So these are your rods or cones. Cones, color sensing, um, high visual acuity rods, night vision, peripheral vision uh, cell types. And those cells are the deepest within the retina, and their job is to collect light. So they initiate the cascade that ultimately leads to vision. And then below them, now these are very needy cells. These are like the, the divas of the retina. So they do a lot of work, they know they do, they demand a lot of attention. And so their handmaidens are, are the retinal pigment epithelial cells that lie right beneath them. And they provide all the nutrients and oxygen and other metabolites necessary to keep the photoreceptors going. And the photoreceptors pound for pound are the most metabolically active cells in your entire body. They work harder than any other cell that you have. So the RPE is very important for providing those nutrients and also removing waste products very, very quickly. Okay, So they're kind of the Batman and Robin of, of the retina. But the photoreceptors are, are connected to an intermediate neuron uh, called a bipolar cell, which then connects to another cell type called a ganglion cell. So it's kind of a three-neuron arc or a three-wire circuit. And that goes back to the brain, and uh, that information is collected and uh, developed into a, a visual percept. There are other cells, too, but for the, for the interest of, of simplicity, I'm going to keep it at these three, three, three types of cells. So light enters, in this case, from the roof, goes down, strikes a specialized antenna at the outermost portion of the photoreceptor called an outer segment. That initiates a chemical event, which eventually is converted to an electrical signal that passes all the way through the system and back to the brain. Okay? So when, in terms of degenerative diseases of the retina, they kind of come in two flavors. The inner degenerative diseases that affect the inner part of the retina and those that affect the outer portion. There's also diseases that kind of affect the whole thing, and I'll talk about them later if there's interest. Uh, but the inner ones, the prominent one we think about is like glaucoma. Okay, so glaucoma, in that case, the degeneration occurs at the level of the ganglion cell. That's not my interest. That's the interest of other people in, in uh, the Department of Ophthalmology, wonderful researchers uh, like Rob Nichols and other folks that are looking at glaucoma and new treatments for that disease. My interest is in the outer portion, the Batman and Robin, photoreceptors and, and retinal pigment epithelium. So let's look at them a, a slightly different way. So this is actually a slab of RPE, because when I show it to you in 2D, it's kind of hard to get a, a concept of what I'm talking about. The retina is really is a 3D tissue. 
So the retinal pigment epithelium, each one of the, oops, I gave away that one all too soon. So the retinal pigment epithelium is all these little cobblestoned, and it's pigmented, so it's kind of brownish black. And so that, this is what they look like. They actually have little appendages that stick up that I can't really show. And then layered on top of that are those photoreceptors. So each one of these, and this is from a friend of mine in Spain, Nico Suenka, who's just an outstanding uh, histologist. And so each one of these little guys here is a cone photoreceptor. And this is that little antenna that collects light. And then these, they don't show the whole cell, but these are all the rods. So these are cones. The rods aren't shown here, but they're shown down here. And you can see how they interdigitate and they interact with the RPE in a particular 3D environment. And so you have to then kind of compound this to get the idea that you're talking about the entire retina. So you're talking about millions and millions of cells with these precise arrangements. So the outer retinal degenerative diseases then affect one or both of these cell types. So there are some, like retinitis pigmentosa, that have defects in the photoreceptors, which lead ultimately to their demise, which of course would cause blindness because you no longer have that initiating uh, cell type to start the visual cascade. Other diseases primarily affect the retinal pigment epithelium, which as I said before, since it's so ne necessary for the photoreceptors to stay alive, when they're dead and gone, there's no one to make the bed, make dinner, and they die too. Right? So this is retinitis pigmentosa. This is a disease that primarily affects photoreceptors. It's a genetic disease. Over 100 different genes can cause this. Leads to the death of initially rods and then cones, but doesn't affect primarily RPE usually. And then here's the other big one, age-related macular degeneration, which is not a genetic disease per se. It's a, it's, we see it as, you, as the population ages. There are some genes that can contribute to it. It causes an initial defect in the RP. It results in an initial defect in the RPE, which then leads to loss of photoreceptors. And so here you see a large patch here in the center where photoreceptors and RPE are no longer there, and that leads to that large central scotoma or blind spot that happens in individuals that get the severe form of this disease. Okay, so if the problem is that you're missing parts, how do what one of the solutions possibly would be to replace those parts? The issue is, is there's no way to, to get these normally. So your body doesn't have stem cells in the retina to begin with. Um, if you just take a, a, a cadaver eye, for instance, and try to get the, the photoreceptors or RPE from that, that doesn't work well. Um, so there's really has, there really was no way to get replacement parts for these types of diseases. Same holds for a lot of the neural diseases, degenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Then along in two, came in 1996, 1997, Jamie Thompson's pioneering work that looked at embryonic stem cells. So the ability to uh, produce a cell that has the capacity, at least theoretically, to make every cell in your body from a cell type that originates in a five-day blastocyst. So those stem cells, and then there's another type that came along that I'll mention in a moment, called an induced pluripotent stem cell that's derived from adult cells, essentially blood or skin. And then those are genetically reprogrammed to a state very similar, if not identical, to an embryonic stem cell. And the key for both of those is that they have a couple of basic properties, and that is they're able to divide and make more of themselves indefinitely. So there's theoretically they're an indefinite supply. Once you have a cell line, one of these cell lines, you can, make, you can make it divide and you have an unlimited supply of whatever you want to make. And then secondarily, you should be able to coerce it to go on and produce multiple different cell types. Okay? That's great. It makes it very powerful. It also makes them very difficult to work with because if you have a cell type that's so uh, clay-like that it can produce any cell type in your, in your body, how do you go about steering it towards the cell type that you're interested in? So in our, my case, photoreceptors are RPE. So you've got to somehow be able to recapitulate all those signals and cues that normally occur to make a photoreceptor in a developing embryo in a dish somehow. And so it's very daunting. But not all stem cells are alike. So I mentioned embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. Stem cells exist also in tissues, like I just mentioned before. So these tissue-specific adult stem cells that you hear about so often usually are bone marrow stem cells. Sometimes there are stem cells that people talk about that are in fat or in other parts of your body. And that gets confusing because people will throw around the term stem cells all the time, assuming you don't know the difference. And so if you just hear stem cells, you'll think it's all, they're all the same thing. But in fact, these do not, they are not able to make the retinal cell types that we're talking about. None of those adult tissue-specific ones, either from bone marrow or other places, have the capacity to make retina. Unlike the pluripotent stem cells that I just mentioned, oops, let's go back here. Yeah, unlike the pluripotent stem cells that I mentioned, the ES or IPS cells. And so here are the sources. I already mentioned them. I'll just briefly go over them again. 
Uh, Jamie Thompson was the person who first developed the, the technique to take what's called the inner cell mass from a five-day blastocyst and grow that in culture and be able to expand that. Those are called embryonic stem cells. And as I mentioned, that has the capacity, at least theoretically, to make every single cell type in your body. Then around 2006, 2007, Jamie Thompson, along with another researcher in Japan, uh, Yamanaka, developed a way to take adult cells, at first fibroblasts from a skin sample, but ultimately blood as well, and reprogram uh, them with a few genetic twists back to this embryonic stem cell-like state. And this is what they look like. Very similar, have much of the same properties. Okay, so if you have this, these, these clay-like cells then, and your ultimate goal is to be able to produce photoreceptors and RPE and maybe even entire uh, retinal tissues, how are you going to go about doing that? So I mentioned before, very daunting. Well, we, that's where we turn to development. We turn to, to all the information that we already have about how the retina develops in, a, in an organism, in a mammal, different, different species. So that's kind of our blueprint. Our blueprint is looking at the steps that we already know of and the cues that are involved in producing a retina. So here's an example here at a very early stage. This is a developing neural tubes. This is where your, the brain will develop from. And the, and the retina develops as an outpouching or a ballooning out of the brain. That's why it's part of the brain. And it's called an optic vesicle at this stage. And if you look at it in 3D, it kind of looks like this. So it's truly a vesicle. It's a, it's a hollow ball of cells. And over time, if you let it mature and give it the right cues and signals, it'll produce all the different cell types that I showed you before in the neural retina, as well as the RPE. Um, the other parts of the eye, including the lens here and the cornea, develop separately. Okay, that's important to know. So they don't, the whole eye doesn't develop as one unit. It develops as separate units that then come together. Okay, so we developed over the course of a number of years a uh, technique or a protocol to be able to take those, embryo those um, iPS cells and embryonic stem cells, but for the most part we use iPS cells, taken from individuals through just a blood sample like you might uh, submit for a cholesterol check, reprogramming them, and then we developed a technique to take them in a series of steps recapitulating the different stages of human retinal development, first by providing very early cues and environments, and then plating those what we call embryoid bodies back down to form these rudimentary neural tubes like early uh, uh, developing brains. And they have little holes in the center here like you, I sh showed you before. And then we can take these central little colonies, looks like little flowers growing. We can kind of pick those up, cut them out, and sure enough, we can get them to form these hollow ball-like structures, which we call optic vesicle-like structures. And along the way, we're changing the cues and, and signals that we're using. Here's a hole in one of these cultures that are grown in a dish where we lifted one of those rudimentary optic vesicle, vesicles from. And if we look at it over time, we'll see that in the area, the skirt around that, we can get that to transform to our retinal pigment epithelial cells. So the first breakthrough was to be able to get these, this, these areas around the developing retina to produce this, that, that uh, support cell type, the retinal pigment, pigment epithelium. And so we'll talk about it later, but this is now advanced in some cases to clinical trials. But what about what's remaining? What I'm really interested in is those photoreceptors, right? Because that's why you go, you lose vision in age-related macular degeneration and are in retinitis pigmentosa is because you lose the photoreceptors. So if these truly are early developing human retinas, then they should be able to produce photoreceptors and other cell types indigenous to the, to the retina. So let's take a look and see if these really are early human retinas. So this is uh, early stage here, and here we're using a special stain that lights up ganglion cells, which are born first in the retina, purple, and then the other green and red cells are specifically lit up or marked as early retinal cells. So they haven't decided what they want to become yet. They're still what we call progenitors. But the ganglion cells, since they make the first decision, have already done so. And so not only have, do we see the production of ganglion cells, but they're in the right place, right? They're forming a layer. A little bit later on, this is a stain now where the red and yellow show primitive photoreceptors. So they're not full-blown, mature photoreceptors, but they've already decided that that's what they want to be. And so they're starting to form in an outer, in a more outer for, uh, uh, location within these optic vesicle structures. And then if we take them out 200 days, and that's the thing, we're confined somewhat to the same number of days and the time that's required to produce a, a human retina, we kind of have to recapitulate that in a dish too, so it takes a long time. But at some point, what we see is we see the development of these hair-like structures on the very outer portion. And they get to be the size of maybe a large um, pinhead. 
So these aren't really big. These are still kind of on the small scale. And so this is what was really remarkable. So if we look at them at this stage, not only do we see that they make mature photoreceptors, but normally you see cones on the very outer portion of the retina, and then the rods are slightly inside of those, and they form a separate layer. And so the rods here are in purple, and the cones, the red-green cones, are here are on the outside. And there are some other ones that are scattered in the middle, but again, they self-organize into what appears to be um, a very normal-looking retina. And this is all in a dish, ultimately uh, from a blood sample. All right, so if we move on a little bit longer, so this is, a, if we want to compare this then to, this is another, this is an actual human retina. If you look at uh, rod, the blue is rods, the red is cones, and you can see how similar, not perfect by no means. This is all, this has never seen the inside of a, of a living thing. It's all been done in a dish, but it looks quite similar to what you might find in a human. Okay, and if we blow that area up even a little bit more, what, what I was intrigued by are these little appendages that I, that I see. Is it possible that we could even grow those light-sensing antenna that we see in, in real human retinas? So are these possibly these light-catching outer segments? So this is a technique called electron microscopy where we can look, up, look real close. And sure enough, we see initially a rudimentary little bud that looks like a budding outer segment. And with additional time, we see that it elongates makes the outer disks, the, the, the uh, outer segments and the, and the disks that are necessary to catch light. And in fact, our group and a group that we collaborated with at Johns Hopkins showed that you, these do detect light and produce electrical signals in a dish. So that's great. That's all, in, a, that's all in, a, uh, in the laboratory. But can we convert what we do in the laboratory to something that can actually be used to treat a human? That's actually that's a difficult thing to do because a lot of the stuff that we do in a laboratory, we use chemicals and treatments that wouldn't be necessarily safe to, to put directly into a human. So then we worked with Weizmann Biomanufacturing, which is located just two floors down at the Weizmann Center from my lab. My lab's the sixth floor of the Weizmann Center. And the biomanufacturing facility, which creates... Uh, products for human use is just two floors down. It's very unique that we have this at the University of Wisconsin. And working with Derek High and the other uh, wonderful people there, we were able to reproduce our protocol and method to be able to do it in such a fashion as it could ultimately go into humans. Okay, so that's cell production. What about installation? So if we can make these cells, what about getting, actually getting them to the place they need to be and getting them to hook up and restore vision? Because that's what we want to do. That's, again, so it's wonderful to be able to have the spare parts, but can we use them? And that's where we still have a lot of hurdles because we're talking about taking a brand new, fresh out of the wrapper photoreceptor and trying to get it to hook up in what ultimately will be a pretty diseased retina. Okay, so the technique is pretty straightforward. A lot of surgeons already do this quite a bit, and that is to be able to make a small hole in the retina and directly inject the cells or place the cells in the space where the photoreceptors used to be or the RPE used to be. So here's an example. Um, in this case, all of the donor human photoreceptors is in, are in red. It's hard to tell the individual ones. Here's one, here's another one here. They're mostly kind of forming a whole layer because in this case, this is a rat that, lo that lost all of its photoreceptors. So we're trying to reconstruct a photoreceptor layer that is now gone. And as you can see, at least anatomically, we're able to do that. The remainder of this is the rat retina that's still remaining after the disease has taken its toll. Okay, and we're working right now to try to be able to optimize this. Are we, are we looking to make the rat see? Yeah, we'd love to see that. We're, we're working towards that. But ultimately, a rat doesn't necessarily tell you what's going to happen in a human. So the most important thing is that what we're doing is safe. Now, another way, one of the issues about doing it this way is that we're kind of injecting these cells as a, as a mixture, so they don't really have any direction to them. And as I showed you earlier, they all have a very precise orientation in order to work properly. So the next stage, or version 2.0, is to really is to put these into perhaps scaffolds, biodegradable scaffolds that are pre-aligned perfectly so that we're recapitulating more of a normal photoreceptor layer. So that these are already preformed so that they're facing the right direction. And for that, we work with a very talented group of engineers here on campus. We have an amazing biomedical engineering group that works with stem cells. And so this is one of these little tiny sheets that they use. Each one of these little dots here is a precisely designed hole that is a receptacle for one photoreceptor. This is a, uh, shown here. Each one of these little lines here is a photoreceptor that now, now is not just a ball, but actually has a direction and polarity, and it's pointing in the right direction. So these sheets then can be placed precisely in the subretinal space. Okay, so what are we, what's going on right now in terms of clinical trials? Everything to date 
that's stem cell related going into humans from uh, pluripotent stem cells, so that's ES or IPS cells, has to do with RPE. And that's because it was discovered first. It's kind of the easiest to grow, and you can grow large amounts of it, and you can make it really, really pure. So there are already clinical trials uh, ongoing looking at placement of RPE, either as a preformed sheet or as in a dissociated kind of mixture of cells. And these are some of the people that are uh, pursuing it at, at present. There hasn't been any dramatic uh, you know, improvements in vision, but you've got to kind of think that's the case because these are all diseases that they're treating that have lost RPE and photoreceptors, yet they're only trying to replace the RPE and not the photoreceptors. So you're kind of missing two critical parts of the engine, and you're only replacing one of them. So ultimately, the key, I believe, is to be able to introduce the photoreceptors alone, if that's all you need, or with the RPE to augment the ongoing clinical trials uh, of which we have a lot of collaborations with those individuals so that we'll be able to piggyback onto those. And so we have a couple of uh, large grants from the National Eye Institute. They believe in this enough where they established what's called the Audacious Goals Initiative that put a lot of funds for the next 10 years into the precise goal of, re of replacing photoreceptors and ganglion cells in the human retina and restoring vision. So I really feel like we're on the forefront of that, of that effort nationwide and really worldwide. Okay, so this is my, this is kind of the hype end of, of things too. So, you know, not, no significant technology was invented overnight. So computers that we use now that are in our cell phones, I mean, everyone can remember 20 years ago or so, I you know, calculators and an app, I had an Apple IIc and BASIC. And so there's, version, there's always version 1.0, 3.0, 20.0, so on and so forth. And hopefully you make good decisions, you learn from your mistakes, and then you proceed and make a better product down the line. Same thing with stem cell technology. It's not going to be a grand slam home run right out of the gate. We're hoping to be safe. We're hoping to make some uh, improvements in people's vision. But it's going to take iterations of the technology before we make dramatic uh, improvements in patients' uh, uh, vision. Uh, but we think we'll get, we'll get there if we make the right, the, uh, right decisions and make sure, first and foremost, that we're safe. And so this is uh, the... Warning to everybody, so anytime you have kind of a, uh, a cell type or other product that's getting a lot of hype, you're going to get people coming out of the woodwork trying to sell you that magic thing, and it'll cure, it'll cure what's, what, what's, what ails you. The two things to look for that will really set apart the, what to believe and what not to believe, the things that are the red flags are money and promises, right? So at this point, none of this deserves a dollar from you. Okay, so we're, it's experimental. We need to seek out people to be involved in these clinical trials. You're taking risks by being involved in them. So somebody that says, I'll do it, but for $40,000 has an inherent conflict of interest because they're making their living off of it. And if they say, not only will this cure your age-related macular degeneration, but it'll take care of your rheumatism, and it will get your, you know, so on and so on. Your memory will be better. and all. You know. So these are the sort of things that we all laugh at and say, I'd never fall for that, but you'd be surprised. When you're facing a devastating disease in yourself or a loved one, you kind of want it, you, you look for that silver lining, and there are people that will take advantage of that. So in summary, technology is there. We can build, we can get the spare parts, not only as individual cells, but as retinal tissues, which is what gets me up every day. It's really a remarkable thing, and I'm very uh, fortunate to be involved in it. We're a leader here at the UW-Madison in many ways. Installing these pieces that we can make is still a challenge that we're working on. But the expertise, the equipment, the resources, the collaborative team spirit that we have at the UW really is unique. And it was born here, and it's being developed probably as fast, if not faster here, than anywhere else in the world. And then if you want to be tortured a little bit more, uh, I did write a little article, uh, about a three-page article, that summarizes a lot of what I discussed here as the hope and the hype portion of it. Um, and I think it's available on the departmental website, but it's also available at www.vision.wisc.edu. Uh, so that you don't have to try to memorize everything I just whipped through. And then I want to say, just to, to finish up, I want to thank the folks in the lab. It's grown over the years. There's been a number of people that have done the work that I've, that I've had the pleasure and, and uh, privilege to be able to talk to you about today. Um, and I want to emphasize the fact that what you've seen here is what my lab does. And my lab is just one of hundreds on campus that are vision science oriented that really work together to try and get a handle and to get therapies on these big problems that have been facing humankind since the dawn of, since the dawn of time, really. So uh, Wisconsin is a really, truly unique place to be, and I'm very, very uh, privileged to be here. 
And then lastly, just to let folks know, we're also, we also do this because we have uh, the, the funding to do it, and these are the folks that have been uh, generous in, in terms of uh, funding the research that we've done over the years. So thank you very much. take questions. Oh, Just a second. Yes, yeah, stand up. Stand up. <laughs> Stay here. Hi, my name is Gillian Fink. I work at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. I serve as the development director, and I get to talk with people like you intermittently. And it is the best part of my work. And then in addition to that is um, helping bring speakers to this um, sight-saving session. And we're going to have some question and answer for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have our closing speaker. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll walk to you, and I can um, bring you the microphone. Thank you. Uh, how do you know what's safe for a rat will be safe for a human? So you don't. So you don't. So it's, it's an excellent point, and one that we've gone back and forth on. In fact, I can tell you that, that my progression uh, from doing the work that I do in the laboratory to uh, kind of bridging it over and saying, okay, when do you go, when do you go to a human, right? It's a hard one. And initially I said, well, you know, you gotta, I got to see that it's going to be safe and it's going to work in, in three different animal models and this and that. There is a list as long as my arm of, tech, of uh, protocols and products that have cured blindness in mice, right? Um, and a, a lot of them don't work in humans. So ultimately, all you really can do is you can do the best you can to see, show that it's safe, and to do that, we use multiple species, so not just mouse and rat, um, but a larger animal species as well. We have a, a primate center here on campus, so we get as close as we can to humans. Um, there are also other animals. We have the vet school here. There are dogs and um, uh, pigs that also get natural forms of, of blindness, so we feel good about that. So we, we're not only developing therapies that ultimately will help humans, but ultimately uh, inherited diseases in, in animals as well. Um, I'm not going to say we're totally altruistic, and you know, it's, we have a, we, our, our goal is to help human patients, um, but that is a nice bridge that we have with the folks that we work at the, with at the veterinary school. So you do the best you can. The FDA looks over your shoulder the whole way, which is a great thing. People often think of them as, as, the, as a negative because they're slowing down progress. That's not what they're doing at all. They're there to make sure things are safe. And we don't, even though we're, if we're even if we are well-meaning, uh, and most of us are, um, we don't see everything. I mean, they have more experience. They've been through this many, many different times. They've seen uh, you know, pitfalls that I can't think of. And so those discussions are really important. But that's it. But it's ultimately that phase one trial for safety. There are risks involved in that. It's never been done before. Um, one of the benefits and one of the reasons why the eye is ahead of all other tissues at this point is because the risks are somewhat uh, lower because you have two eyes. The eye is an encapsulated organ. Worst case scenario, if it's a blind eye, you can remove it. If there's something untoward like a tumor or something like that or a bad infection, um, you can actually see in real time. You can dilate the pupil, look right in and see what's going on. I don't have to put you in an MRI uh, to be able to do that once every two weeks. If you say, my eye kind of hurts, doc, I can see you in an hour and see what's going on. So there's a lot of advantages to working in the eye so that people that aren't even interested in really blinding diseases are moving to the eye just because it's more amenable to these types of therapies. Hi, I've had uh, several retinal detachments in the last few years in my right eye, and uh, because of that, I've limited vision in that right eye, but I believe at this point it's the cells in the back of the retina were damaged due to the procedures and trying to get my retina to stay attached again. Would I, I guess the question is, does this apply to someone like myself or just to diseased cells and then if it does apply to someone like me, would it be a better shot at working in that they were not diseased cells around them? So um, it's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up because it brings up the idea of spectrums and, and magic bullets and things like that, right? So, so we make parts. So the easiest thing you could think of would be, okay, somebody's missing a single cell. And if we can go in and replace that single cell, the rest of the, the, the retina is totally healthy and ready to accept that new cell. So that's kind of your first target, right? You keep things simple. You just want to make sure it's safe and that perhaps it works. So you don't want to start with the world's most difficult thing to cure, 
right? So then you might have a two-cell disease like macular degeneration, which actually is more than two cells, but something like that. And say, okay, well, that's a little bit more difficult, but then that's the next level. Then you have maybe more full thickness issues that have other issues to, along with it. So for instance, a retinal detachment that's chronically detached, you also get remodeling. So the cells don't keep their perfect layering. You can get scarring, so you can get fibrous tissue that, that, are, that would be a physical barrier to integration of new cells, um, and so on and so forth. So the answer is yes, actually chronic retinal detachment is definitely on our list, but it's going to be a more difficult row to hoe than some of these other ones. Now the benefit is that there's nothing inherently um, diseased about the retina, right? It's an injury. It's an injury model. So the same thing that you might, somebody might get if it's a penetrating injury or a macular hole or something where it's a physical damage to the, the retina as opposed to an inherent disease process. So there are benefits because you don't have to deal with the disease, ongoing disease. In case of AMD you, or a macular degeneration, if you replace those cells, you still got all the kind of crud that's going on that, that's the, in, the, in the midst of where you're putting these new cells. So um, again, it's, it's a spectrum, but injuries and physical damage in the retina is also on the list, slightly harder, or maybe more than slightly. Yes, um, I don't know who's next. Uh, oh, so for instance, for the most part, uh, glia is something we try to, we make plenty of glia. We, we actually try to eliminate that as much as we possibly can because it can form scar. That's the source of most of the scar. Glia have a, a normal, uh, important role to play in the retina. We're not quite sure how much of that we have to recapitulate, but again, trying to keep things simple and moving things forward. In terms of, these are great questions because they bring up broad, this is why I have an hour and a half talk. And it's, I actually hit on these things when I'm given the time, but no one's dumb enough to give me the time. So, um, but with regard to that, you bring up the issue of timing. Not only timing in terms of when of the disease, like do you, do you intervene early in the disease? Well, if you're seeing well, you don't want an experimental therapy. I'm not going to do an experimental therapy on you if you're seeing well. If you wait too long, maybe you have all that scarring and remodeling. So where's the sweet spot, sweet spot in the disease? You also have, is there a sweet spot in the production of the cells? If you let them get too mature, like I'm showing up here that I'm like oh, so excited about, that's great if you want to model a disease in a dish and test drugs or test gene therapies in a dish. But maybe that's too mature and, they, and they're too fragile, for instance. So we are testing those sort of things. Too young, like an undifferentiated pluripotent stem cell, that's going to give you a tumor. Guaranteed. It's, it's, part of the difference, it's part of the definition of a pluripotent stem cell. It will give you a teratoma if you put it in. So we have to differentiate it at least somewhat. We do have some evidence to suggest that if we get an intermediate cell type, it can kind of go the rest of the way to the, to the uh, finish line by itself. Some of these experiments that you're talking about in terms of cleaning up plaques really aren't cell replacement, though. There are a lot of cells that can, inter that can conjure up a little bit of local inflammation and, and enhance the elimination of waste products. So and that's, again, why some people will say, well, I, I put a stem cell in there. But you can use stem cells to um, release growth factors for protection, or you can actually replace cells. And they, a lot of folks blur the lines between the two. That's why they'll stick a bone marrow stem cell in your eye. And they'll say, oh, it's a stem cell. And you think, oh, yeah, you're going to put those stem cells in my eye, and it's going to rewire and reform all the cells that I've lost. It can't do that. What it can do, perhaps, is secrete some things that make whatever residual cells you still have hanging on there, the Monty Python not quite dead yet, and wake them back up again and help them to, to work, which is a fine strategy, too. But oftentimes, they aren't going to say that because they know what you want. And so they're not going to, they're kind of, again, it's a stem cell. Eh, don't ask questions. So. Some years ago, in, in, uh, when stem cells were young, uh, they had a doctor in Pittsburgh who uh, started a, an experiment with 20 people by the injection of a stem cell into the heart. And the people, the, the heart grew and all that sort of thing. Is, is the injection uh, something that's used by many people on, on the stem cell side? But you have to have a product first, of course. Yeah, you have something to inject. You're right. Yeah, so injection, that's kind of what we're talking about. The, the, low, the lowest fruit is to make the cell type 
purify it, inject it, and let it set it, sort itself out, right? The next stage would be the scaffold like I showed you or a preformed tissue that we can put. So the heart, and actually we have somebody, Tim Camp, who's a world leader on uh, cardiac or cardiovascular cells derived from stem cells here at the, Univer at the University of Wisconsin. Um, heart is, a, is, a, is, a, is a actually a very difficult tissue to address because you've got not on the order of thousands of cells but billions of cells that you need. Um, and it also has to um, integrate within a, a particular scaffold, and you've got neur neural, neural components, you've got vascular components. It's not just a heart muscle cell. You've got a lot of things to be able to replace. One of the benefits, and I'm scooting back to the eye, but one of the benefits of photoreceptors and RPE is there's no vascular supply you have to, there's no innervation. So you really just purely have a two cell um, uh, tissue that you have to replace. A lot of these other ones, liver, um, uh, cardiovascular cells, the cells themselves may not be nearly as complex as a photoreceptor, but the rest of the tissue is harder to uh, put together than you might find in the outer retina. So yes, dissociate, get back to your original question, dissociation of cells is probably the most common way to do it. There are hundreds of ways to uh, donate to the university, and I donate in several different areas. <laughs> Now, if I were to donate money to the uh, to for you know visual research, what, is there a section called the I Institute, or is that a national? Good, it's a good question. So there are two. There's so um, the University of Wisconsin, the Department of Ophthalmology, which I am a member of. Um, has is totally devoted to the clinical care, the surgical care, and research on the eye. The whole University of Wisconsin actually has multiple vision researchers in multiple areas. As you can, as you can imagine, there are engineers, there are mathematicians, uh, there are psychologists that are look, looking at visual perception. Um, so there's a, a whole wide-ranging group of people that are scattered not only across this university, but UW systems and other places in the state. This is a very strong state for vision research. And so uh, the, the, the McPherson Eye Research Institute encapsulates that whole amount. But the biggest part of that is the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science. And we work very, very closely to advance all of these uh, techniques that you see here today. So it's very much hand in, hand in glove. So uh, the eye research, is, uh, is that a section of the building next door? Or? So no. So um, because if you're referring to the, the McPherson Eye Research Institute, because it's really cross-campus, there's, there's, there's a, uh, a central area for administration, but the individual researchers are in their individual labs. Um, so uh, there's not a specific sort of building, but yeah. Uh, in, in dry macular de degeneration in retinitis pigmentosa, the damage is in the RPE and the outer retinal segments, but in wet AMD, it begins with a neovascular membrane under the retina and the choroid. The real brass ring in treating that is to prevent the neovascular membranes from ever forming because all we can do right now is damage control. So my question is, is there any theory that if you restore the health of the outer retinal segment layers and the RPE, will that help to prevent neovascular membranes, membranes from forming? All right, so let me just start with the original statement. So in fact, it's not the blood vessels that are the initial problem. In wet AMD, the first thing that happens is the RPE degenerates. Right. The difference between wet and dry is that in the wet form, you have the dry form, but blood vessels grow up underneath, break and bleed, and accelerate the process. Once you get rid of the blood vessels, if you use VEGF or injections into the eye, you're still left with the residual forest fire that is the dry portion of AMD. So wet AMD is just dry AMD plus. So you can get rid of the, 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 the blood vessels, which will improve vision in many people's cases, but you are not affecting the primary cause of the wet AMD, which is the dry, for, the, the dry portion, the loss of RPE and, um, uh, the, and ultimately photoreceptors. So theoretically, if you successfully treat the dry form, you may be able to eliminate the wet form of it from everything. If you get forming. to it beforehand, if the wet has already occurred, then the, the, the procedure would be to treat the wet form with available VEGF inhibitors, injections, that sort of thing, or removal of the neovascular membrane surgically, because you're going to be in the space anyway, and then replacement of cells that are gone, uh, that occurred as a, a, during the whole process. So yes, that's certain levels. I mean, there's, and there's, 
And if you go really late in the disease, you probably have degeneration and problems with the, with the choroidal vascular layer in between. So the blood supply not, might not be appropriate. So in super late cases, maybe you also have to replace some of the vascular supply underneath the RPE. We don't know that. Time for this one last question, then we'll have our closing presenter right here. I'll hang out so people can. People. Uh, uh, um, does this technique work better on young people or older people? Oh, very good, um, very good. The reason well, why I haven't I asked, seen a, a young person with AMD yet, so I, I we better get I, work. My nephew's daughter has Stargardt's, and she's 13 years old, and that's yeah. why I wanted to know. Technically speaking, one would think that it would work better on, on younger retinas. Okay, and so when, when we were contemplating initial patient treatments, you know, what would we think would be the ideal case? You know, really what we're making here are, are kind of late embryonic cells. I mean, the cells that we make, they're 200, 300 days. They're generally newborn cells. They're, they're full-term gestation. So they're not 50 years old, 60 years old. Even though they might come from a 60-year-old person, that's their newborn cells that we grow in the, in the, in the dish. So the idea then is, you know, new wine into new, old, into, into new, into new wine skins or, you know, new wine into old wine skins. So ideally, you know, I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist, so we occasionally, quite rarely, there are children that are born premature that have what's called retinopathy or prematurity. And so they're newborns, and if they have a really severe form and their retina detaches, if we get to them early enough, it might very well be that that's ideal, right? Now, you're not going to start with a premature baby as your first, as your first patient, but th- again, that might be better. And we saw that with gene therapy trials, where initially, for safety reasons, they had to take older patients that could consent on their own, make sure that it was safe. They knew that these are people that have been blind since near birth, so getting them, you know, getting them a, replacing their gene when they're 32 maybe won't do much because they're not really wired to see, maybe. As that was shown to be safe, they moved earlier and earlier and earlier. So, yes, the, ultimately the goal is if it's safe and we do our homework and we don't trip up along the way or let rogue stem cell clinics really uh, smirk the whole operation, we will be able to gradually and, expedi- and well, expeditiously, hopefully, but safely, Move towards patients that might be even more might benefit even more than our initial targeted patients. You guys are good. I, I, every single question was, I think, an, another series of five slides that I took out of this talk because I only had <laughs> twenty minutes and I took thirty. I'm sure. Yeah, I think you mentioned it's in their clinical development right now in the mm-hmm. procedure. Uh, I kind of in the pharmaceutical or uh, drug development, typically it's going from discovery, preclinical, and clinical has three phase. So I mm-hmm. assume this is probably phase one or something. Oh yes. And typically for drug preclinical for photoreceptor still preclinical. Yeah, I, I guess this is probably medical. It's different for pharmaceutical. You phase one you do on the healthy subject, but it's hard to get volunteer to yeah. do this. <laughs> And so in that case, it's still, I guess, it was safety is a major concern, right, phase one. Absolutely. And in this case, you probably would get a volunteer or someone yep. who is already You would recruit to generally a handful of patients you're looking for. They're going to be the worst of the worst, right, the ones that have really nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're also going to be the patients that have, are probably the least likely to benefit. Right. And so that's always important when you hear these phase one trials and everyone's hoping for the, ho- the grand slam home run. Again, it's gonna. It, if you got to keep, if you don't manage expectations, like I said, everyone's gonna expect a home run right off the bat, and they're gonna say, "Oh, okay, I didn't explode, but he wasn't reading the paper the next day." What this this stuff sucks, you know. So, but that's not what what it's designed for. I mean, perhaps the best we could possibly hope for in that first cadre of patients was no one got hurt, everyone's fine, their vision, whatever remaining vision, didn't go down, and maybe they had some indices that were that that showed improvement. And then you look and you say, okay, what, what about this seemed to work well? What didn't seem to work well? How do we adjust the product? Or how do we adjust who we aim, aim it at? So it's, again, trying to align those moon, moons of production and target. And there will be a sweet spot in there, not for every disease, but for some. Um, too often what people do is they take a product and they just uh, shotgun everything, right? And there may be a subset of those patients, and you know this, that really do benefit. But when you wash them out across everybody, it looks like nothing Nothing happened. So again, that's, there's risks along the way. And so if we're not careful, there's a lot of ways to just put the, the kibosh on all this work, not because it's not doesn't have hope, it doesn't have potential, but because we asked the wrong question, picked the wrong patient, right. got ahead of ourselves. So assume this going smoothly through phase one, 
and ultimately go to phase three and get approved. How long it takes for this kind of a in medical? The, I'll give you an example. The gene therapy trial for RPE65 is now, I think, 14, 15 years into it and just got approved. So, um, so it's a long process. That doesn't mean that it, doesn't, it isn't going to be available for patients to, um, on, a, on a wider scale prior to FDA approval, but um, it's, it is a long process, and it should be, honestly. Uh, again, it's, it's patient safety that we're all mostly uh, concerned about. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your great questions. I'm going to, and thank you, Dr. Gam sure. and Dr. Young, for hosting this evening and presenting. I'm going to um, bring up our closing speaker. His name is Russell Rothman, and he is connected to us, um, the Department of Ophthalmology, um, in many ways. But one of them, he's, um, it's his first day serving on the advisory board. And this is his <laughs> for the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. So please welcome him up to give some closing remarks. And thank you all for coming and your time and interest and great questions. Thanks, Russ. start by saying that if there ever was a hard act to follow, <laughs> that's what I'm up against. Interestingly enough, I come to the UW ophthalmology department world from an entirely different place. I dare say that for every Dr. Young, Dr. Gam, there are 10,000 of us who are oblivious to it all. And we just function every day and we expect our eyes to work and we don't think a lot about it. And I'm here, given that I have now been a patient for over 15 years, and I thought I would, given that I was given the opportunity, uh, give you some thoughts on what I've learned and my observations on this remarkable department. I, uh, I remember, given the fact that I had what I certainly thought of as perfect vision for an easy 50 years. Uh, as a kid, my mother used to use the term eagle eyes, and I kind of was proud of that. I remember one time getting an eye test, and I was 2015, and I was quite certain I was the epitome of eagle eyes. And consequently, I felt pretty good about this whole sense of my abilities and what the situation was. And I remember the first time I ever felt differently. I, I was in a Walgreens store waiting, killing time to get a prescription. And I'm wandering around, and I went to the reading glasses display uh, probably like you, you, we call these cheaters. <laughs> and, and I put one on, I put a pair on one time thinking, all right, what are these for? And I picked up, I don't know, a box of aspirin or something, and ooh, wow, <laughs> look what I could read and see. And uh, it was pretty remarkable. I mention it because not terribly long after that, I began to have what amounted to an inordinate number of floaters in one of my eyes. And I thought to myself, well, I better find out what this is all about. Ended up coming here. And to get to the end of it, I ended up having what's referred to as a vitrectomy, which is a pretty neat procedure. They'll open up your eye and vacuum all that stuff out and put some new in and close it up and you're good as new. And even when I was done with that, I still had this rather self-opinion that I had managed that well and that I had done the right thing. And in truth, Dr. Michael Altawheel, who had done the work, kept saying, oh, you have to keep coming back. We want to make sure everything's fine. And it might have been as much as two years later. I was in getting one of these mandatory checkups. And they did my eye pressures, and it was way up. And the end result was it was the first indication of what ultimately was my diagnosis for glaucoma. And let me tell you, if, and I suspect some of you might be in the same boat with me, 
But when that comes to you, and that circumstance is in front of you, you, uh, you put away all your cavalier attitudes about how well you've managed it, and you begin to think, oh, what am I going to do? How is this going to handle? What options do I have other than anticipating going blind? And this is when my attitude changed and when there was a, a transformation. And that transformation, ultimately, I gave it a lot of practice. I ended up with a second vitrectomy. I ended up with a cataract removal. I had infections in my... I have been here as often as anybody in the last 15 years. And the end result is, is that I've come to a realization that, and, and I'm, I'm characterizing what I think is the way people in the UW ophthalmology department think. It's probably an unfair thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. The thought is, is that I don't think anybody in that department thinks of any one of us as his patient or her patient. I truly think they think of us as our patient. And to have the researchers, <laughs> Dr. Cam, to have all of the, the remarkable capabilities that goes far beyond simply getting your eyes in new glasses. The things that are capable here not only make me appreciative, but in truth, I am deeply grateful. And that's my whole point in being here, is to say for those of us who come into this circumstance of interacting with this department, we are pretty fortunate. And for us to simply go about our lives on a daily basis without recognizing it, I think would be an error. And so I'm taking my chance now, given the unexpected opportunity to come and tell you my story, to say thank you and to say however you can keep it up. Thank you so much and good night. Okay, <laughs> two tough acts to follow. <laughs> so I just want to uh, close by saying that it takes a village to do this kind of work, and there are a number of folks I'd like to recognize tonight. Nicole Hyman, Chris Geiger, David Peleth, Gillian Fink, Jessica Arendas, Michelle Chizik, and Christine Syme. Thank you so much for all the behind-scenes work that you've done to make this uh, evening a success. I'd also like to sp uh, thank the speakers, Russ and David. Thank you so much. And uh, to remind you that there's another saving, saving site session, October 26, 2017, where Dr. Julie Mares will speak about um, nutrition and its relationship to age-related macular degeneration. I wish you all a good evening and safe travels home. Thank you.